Act 2. You are listening to a story of America's First Christmas, as written by author John Antell and described in his book, Seven Leaderships of the American Revolution. Primary parts are read by John Antell as George Washington, Jeff Bolton as narrator, and Edward Brace as Henry Knox and Colonel Rawl. Christmas, 1776. America's first Christmas is only two days away. General George Washington and his miserable, ragged band of American patriots have successfully eluded capture from the mighty British army, but just barely. The British, under General Cornwallis and his German mercenaries, nipped at the heels of the American army. The army barely escaped, and only because of the resourcefulness of Washington and his officers. The Americans are now safely camped on the Pennsylvania side of the frigid Delaware River. The American camp is a collection of lean-tos and shabby tents. Fires dot the camp as men scavenge for food, search for firewood, and try to stay warm. In August 1776, only one month after signing the Declaration of Independence that declared the establishment of the new American nation, the Americans fielded a force of nearly 25,000 men. Now, in December, Washington's amateur army has about 2,000 men, but many are sick and without shoes and winter clothing. Since August, the Americans have known only defeat, privation, and retreat. Washington, their commander-in-chief, has not won a single battle against the mighty British Army. In less than 10 days, on December 31, 1776, the enlistments of Washington's soldiers will expire. The men will then be able to go home with honor, leaving the fear of death, the intense cold, and the near-starvation life they are living, and go home to hearth, fire, and rest. Who can blame them? The Redcoats, on the other hand, possess a force of nearly 45,000 soldiers. These men are superbly equipped, fully provisioned, and competently led. In addition, the British Army is supported by the most powerful navy in the world, the Royal Navy. The torch of American liberty is nearly extinguished. It seems that the American Revolution will soon end in inglorious defeat. In spite of this, Washington is planning his next move. On the other side of the Delaware, at the village of Trenton, New Jersey, the Hessians are quartered under Colonel Johann Gottlieb Rawl. It is dawn, December 20th, 1776. The drums are beating at sunrise, calling the stand to arms, and the Hessian infantry are forming. Other Hessian soldiers are readying the cannon. Rawl's fierce mercenaries serve British King George III. Rawl's men are soldiers for hire and all long-term professional warriors. They sign up for 12 years of hard drill and stern discipline. They are expert fighters. The Hessian commander, Colonel Rawl, is 56 years old and has been a professional soldier for 45 years all of his adult life. He has decades of combat experience and is considered the best German commander in the British Army in North America. His men idolize him and trust him implicitly. He leads from the front. He has never lost a fight. In short, he is a formidable commander. Rawls' drummers signal the stand to arms. The tall Hessians, in immaculate blue uniforms and high black boots, stand in formations, two men deep and eight men abreast. In battle, they will use these formations to level their muskets and deliver withering fire on any opponent foolish enough to face them. Colonel Rawl inspects a few of his men, then turns to his adjutant, Lieutenant Wiederholt. Bericht, report. Herr Oberst, we have uh, 1,500 men and six cannon on our rolls. Ammunition, food, fodder for the horses, and water is in good supply. We had two men slightly wounded in the skirmish last night with the rebels on horseback. No rebels captured or killed. For hospital calls this morning, 18 men reported sick. Total fit for duty, 1,480 men and six cannon. Very good. Any reply from the British General Cornwallis about our situation here. Nein, Herr Oberst. His last dispatch merely stated that you are free to build defenses as you see fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't not yet understand my situation here in this backward, god-awful land. We hold this stinking pig side of a village, but the rebels roam the countryside at night and shoot up my outposts. My men must constantly patrol this blasted countryside day and night just to keep these peasant bumpkins at bay. You understand, yeah? Ja? Jawohl, Herr Oberst. But I think the rebels will not last long. We will catch them and then send them under guard to the prison ships in New York. I think in the future, my dear Wiederhold, we will not take prisoners. 
Better to use the bayonet against these traitors. <laughs> Jawohl, Herr Oberst. That would send them a stern message. Yeah, it would. You see, we stand to arms every morning at dawn in order to repel any attacks from this rebel riffraff. Their skirmishing parties only consist of two, three, or four men, usually on horseback, attacking our outpost and then running away. But they keep my men from resting. I have not made any redoubts or any kind of fortifications because I have the enemy in all directions. Our men are getting worn out from this incessant patrolling. Building redoubts around this dung heap would only fatigue them more. Mm. The men concur with you, Herr Oberst. I speak with them often about this. They have no fear of the rebels. When I ask my superiors for more troops to capture these peasant raiders, particularly that they should send me a detachment of cavalry, I am told not to worry. Look here at this letter from our British commander. Rawl's adjutant, Lieutenant Wiederholt, takes the letter from Colonel Rawl. The adjutant reads the dispatch out loud. Here's the report from General Convalis. Tell the colonel that he is safe. Only a corporal's guard is needed to keep the peace in Jersey. I am sorry to hear your brigade has been fatigued or alarmed. You may rest assured that the rebel army in Pennsylvania is scattered about in small parties under the command of junior officers, none of them are of the bank of captain, and their principal object is to pick off some of our light dragoons. In any case, we will keep up our patrols. If any of our outpost is attacked at night, sound the alarm, and we will send out most of the regiment out to capture them. With enough men in the chase, we can bag the rebels and serve them to Cornwallis as a Christmas present. Jawohl, Herr Oberst. We will give these peasants a Christmas present they will never forget. We will give them a taste of the Hessian steel. In any case, we can beat this rabble, these Americans. Whenever we meet them in battle, day or night, it does not matter. They are not soldaten. The Americans always run away. They are not even worth the ammunition it takes to kill them. Jawohl, Herr Oberst! The scene now shifts to Washington's camp near McConkie's Ferry in Pennsylvania. The sun is setting in a cold, wintry sky. It is late on the evening of 23 December. General Washington is informed by Colonel Knox that General Gates has arrived with 800 men. Washington goes out of the farmhouse that serves as his headquarters to meet Gates. Knox follows, but Washington signals to Knox to wait so he can talk with General Gates in private. General Gates, it's good to see you. Let's go into my headquarters where it's warm and talk. I have much to discuss with you. Let's discuss issues here, sir. As you wish. With the men you have arrived with and with the soldiers from General Sullivan's group, we have nearly now 3,000 men. I'm planning an enterprise, and I want your opinion. Gladly. Uh, the least I can do is tell you what is on my mind. Our prospects seem bleak, to put it mildly. Impossible would be a better word for it. The British have very strong forces in New Jersey, and as soon... As the Delaware River freezes, they will cross. That, sir, will be the end of us. Do you know that General Lee has been captured by the British? Yes, yes, an unfortunate business. But listen to what I have to say first. I, I received a letter from Congress. Uh, they are evacuating Philadelphia and have put all authority for the fate of our young nation in my hands and in this small army. Oh, my God. It's worse than I thought. Even Congress has no faith that we can stop the British. Hear me out. I propose that on Christmas Day, as soon as it becomes dark, we take our army across the Delaware, march to Trenton, where there is a Hessian garrison, and attack the Hessians before dawn. With luck, we can take them by surprise and reverse the fortunes of war in our favor. What do you think? Hmm, sir, you do not want to know what I think. Yes, sir, I do. Please. I hope you will help me lead this effort. Lead? Effort? I think you're out of your mind. Your army is weak, sick, and in no means ready to launch any kind of attack. You have ammunition for only a day's fight. Your men will not stand their ground. They've been running away from the British since August. And you have the gall to say that you want to attack the Hessians. You bloody well know that the Hessians are the fiercest, best trained, and best equipped European soldiers in the enemy's entire force. And you propose to attack? With this rabble? They only have to wait until the end of the month and their enlistments will run out. Yes, I propose we attack. And with these men. 
These men have stayed the course. Others have deserted, but these lads have not. General, if you think you can beat the Hessians with this motley band, you are sadly mistaken. I'll have no part of this. Face it. We are beaten. Beaten! Don't you understand? It's over! Over, you say. Yes, the odds are against us are steep, but we are not beaten. Yes, my men are in sorry shape. Yes, we will take a huge risk to cross the Delaware at night in such weather, march nine miles, and then fight a battle against the enemy's best troops. I know that a more reasonable man would most likely take your advice. I'm sure that if you were in command at this moment, that you might act differently than I, but... I will never surrender, General Gates. You see, I am unreasonable for the cause of liberty. And if you ever talk with our men, you might learn that many of them feel the same way. To these men, our liberty is very much worth fighting for. <sighs> You're either suicidal or have gone completely That's mad. That's enough, sir. I am still in command of this army, and I am giving you an order. You are to leave this camp post-haste, and you are not to tell anyone of our discussion. Gladly. I will find Congress. Report to them of your lunacy and do my best to have you removed as our commander. Do your worst, General Gates, do your worst. But you will leave immediately, and your men will stay. In a huff, General Gates turns and walks back to his horse. Washington stands alone for a solitary, terrible moment as Gates rides away. In that moment, Washington feels that he is all alone. The future of the newly formed United States of America, the lives of his soldiers, and the fate of generations yet unborn all rest on his shoulders. Washington shivers from a gust of icy wind. The frigid breeze brings him back to the present. Tomorrow will be Christmas Eve. Time is slipping by, and he has much to do. General Washington, sir, I have assembled the commanders in the farmhouse. We are ready to receive your orders. Victory or death, Henry. Victory or death. Sir? Victory or death. That will be our watchword. There's no turning back now. I'm determined that this enterprise will succeed. You are listening to A Story of America's First Christmas, as written by author John Antell and described in his book, Seven Leadership Lessons of the American Revolution.